Good evening and welcome to May versus Corbyn Live, the battle for number 10. Over the next 90 minutes, we'll see what the Prime Minister, Theresa May, and Labour's leader, Jeremy Corbyn, are really made of. Our live studio audience will be asking the questions they and you want answered direct to Mrs May and Mr Corbyn. And I'll be interviewing them both about their policies, their leadership and their vision for the future of a post-Brexit United Kingdom. The Labour leader arrived here in West London a short time ago. He'll be first to face our audience in just a moment. And the Conservative leader is here too. Both are preparing for an evening that could define the rest of the campaign. The battle for number 10 is here and now. Let's get things started then and introduce the leader of the Labour Party, Jeremy Corbyn. At this point, I should point out that the audience members have been carefully selected to provide balance. A third are declared Conservative supporters, a third are for Labour and a third are undecided. So let's get started with our first question, which comes from Ines. Ines. Mr Corbyn, in your speech following the Manchester attack last Friday, you stated that no government can prevent every terrorist attack and that we need a foreign policy that reduces rather than increases the threat to this country. Islamic State have clearly stated that anyone who doesn't abide by their ideology is their enemy. So why should we soften our foreign policy if it is blatantly obvious that there is no room for negotiation? It's not about softening our foreign policy. It is about absolutely condemning what happened in Manchester. Innocent lives were taken, young women and girls out enjoying themselves for the evening. That's the society we live in. That's the society I want to live in. And nobody should be allowed to take that away from anybody. The person who committed it did an appalling and abominable and atrocious act, as did apparently those that were conspiring with him. The police investigation is ongoing. My point was that we have to have a foreign policy around the world that doesn't leave large areas without any effective government, such as in Libya at the present time, which can become a breeding ground of a place of enormous danger to all of us and indeed any Western country in Europe or in North America. My point was absolute condemnation. My point was that we need more police, not less. That's why we're pledged to pre provide 10,000 more police on our streets and that we wanted a foreign policy that didn't leave large areas of the world ungoverned so that we had a more secure future for all of us. And do not allow this to become an attack on our multicultural society or on the wonderful faith of Islam. This is a perversion of Islam that what was done in Manchester as indeed other attacks have been. What we need is a strategy that protects us but a foreign policy that engages with the rest of the world as well to bring about a safer world for all of us. <clears throat> I, just, I just want to throw that back at Ines. Does that satisfy you? It's, I think it's just in terms of foreign policy, you know, are you going to look the other way if there's any military intervention that is needed in that area to support the coalition that are fighting IS? Well, the coalitions that are dealing with IS in, um, in Syria are complex and they're, not, they're sometimes fighting each other as well. My whole point is that we have to cut off the funds for IS, cut off the arms for IS, cut off their publicity as far as we can, but also bring about a peace process in Syria by reconvening the Geneva talks, including all the neighbouring countries as well as Iran, but also bring about a constructive dialogue in Libya so that we don't have huge areas of that country with all its oil wealth underneath it, uh, ungoverned and a prey for this kind of thing. There are desperate people in Libya living in refugee camps. Let's give them something positive and some hope by bringing about stability in that country. It's up to all of us to engage with that because if there is ungoverned spaces around the world then actually everybody's under threat. Well, well let's, let's move it on. A related question from Callum McNeil. 
Good evening, Mr. Corbyn. The horrific events in Manchester are not the first time this nation has faced terrorism. You and two of your senior colleagues openly supported the IRA. How can we really trust you in stopping terrorism? I wanted dialogue in Northern Ireland during the 1970s and 1980s. I did make contact with Sinn Féin when they were not allowed to travel, their leadership was not allowed to travel to Britain, for example. I wanted there to be a process. And that peace process came about by the actions of people such as John Hume, such as Gerry Adams, such as David Trimble, who eventually brought about the ceasefires with both governments, both the Conservative and later with the Tony Blair-led Labour government. And that brought about the Good Friday Agreement, which respects all the historical traditions of Ireland, which is obviously fundamental to bring about peace. And I think we should all be pleased that we've achieved a great deal through the Good Friday Agreement. And you know what? That Good Friday process, recognising those differences, has become a bit of a model for peace processes around the world, where people who were not talking to each other, worse than that, now travel the world together in order to promote peace and dialogue in the Middle East, in Colombia, and in, and in, in the past in South Africa. I think we should be pleased about those achievements. Is, is it worth clarifying for Callum, did, did you vote for the Good Friday Agreement? Yes, I did. Absolutely. Okay, absolutely okay well, um, yes. let's talk about something. I mean, Callum talks about, <clears throat> can we trust you on stopping terrorist threats? Let's talk about something practical. Armed police officers. We think there should be... Uh, Sorry. Fewer? Do you think there should be more? The same? None? I think there should be what is necessary um, in order to save and protect life. I want to live in a society that is safe and secure. Ideally, nobody wants to see armed police officers anywhere. The reality is at the moment, they are there and they have been necessary. Just a quick comeback, Ca Callum. Yeah, Take Callum back, Mr Corbyn, you didn't actually answer my question. You have openly supported the IRA in the past. And I can give you an example attending a commemoration for the eight IRA men who were killed at Loch Gull. Now, in your words, it was to honour them. Maybe you can share with the electorate why those IRA men were actually killed. The commemoration I think you're referring to was a meeting I was at in London where there was a period of silence for everyone who had died in Northern Ireland. Mr okay. Corbyn, the event was actually to commemorate the people the who were killed in Loch Gull. And the, re the reason they were party. killed in Loch Gull and was they were on their way to kill British policemen. And the contribution I made to that meeting was to call for a peace and dialogue process in Northern Ireland. It's only by dialogue and process we brought about the peace in Northern Ireland. And I think that is a good thing. And I think going forward, we need to make sure that in the Brexit negotiations, there is no return or to any kind of hard border between Northern Ireland and the Republic. OK, thank you, Kelly. Uh, John Dare. John. Uh, Mr Corbyn, uh, like many voters, I approve of many of the policies in your manifesto. The problem I have is that I don't see you as someone who could effectively run this country. How can you convince me that you're the man for the job? We wrote this manifesto, which I'm glad you approve of, by consensus within the Labour Party and our affiliated groups and organisations and from the contribution of hundreds of um, non-affiliated political groups who have very important views to communicate to us. We put those forward and we're in government we will carry this manifesto out. This manifesto is about investing in our future. It is about investing in our young people for the future so that we don't have supersized classrooms, we don't have massive waiting lists in hospitals, we don't have a million people waiting for social care, we don't have thousands of people sleeping on our streets. The choice is quite clearly there. This manifesto, investing for the future, taxing more a bit for corporation tax and for the very wealthiest, 95% will pay no more. Or you can go down the road of continuing austerity, continuing cuts in all areas of public expenditure and a never widening gap between the, the richest and the poorest in our society. I am very proud of this manifesto, proud to lead this party. And you know what? I'll be very proud to put this manifesto into action by legislation and by government. And I'm looking forward to the chance of doing it. Uh, Mr Corbyn, John's, John's question was actually, he likes the manifesto, but it Good. was your own leadership he was questioning. Could you just address that to John? Well, I'm sure when John and I get to know each other, we'll get along fine, <laughs> and we'll get to like each other, I'm sure we will. John, okay. people have perceptions about each other, but you know what? In life, 
I meet lots of people. Some I agree with, some I disagree with, some I profoundly disagree with. But I always want to get to know them. Because everybody I meet and everybody you meet knows something we don't know. It should never be so high and mighty you can't listen to somebody else and learn something from them. To me, leadership is as much about using this as using this. Okay, Roxanne. <laughs> Moving on to Roxanne. Where's Roxanne? Roxanne, there you go. Hi, Mr. Corbyn. Um, I'd like to know, for people like myself who voted to leave the European Union and have voted Labour in the past, how are you planning to deal with immigration? Um, the Conservatives have pledged a number. Why won't you? When we leave the European Union, we accept the results of the referendum. It's taken place. It's happened. We accept it. And the priority has to be negotiating tariff-free trade access to the European market to protect jobs in this country. That we will do. It also has to be about the future relationship with Europe because they are, after all, our very close neighbours. On the issue you mentioned of immigration, the free movement is in, implicit in membership of the European Union. It obviously stops when we leave the European Union. In the future, there has to be managed migration and the ha it has to be based on the needs of this country and our economy and of the rights of family reunion. I'm not going to stand here and put a figure. Our Prime Minister has done that now in the third election running and has got nowhere near meeting that figure. I would say we have to have managed migration, we have to have protection of EU nationals living here, just as much as there should be protection of British nationals, of which there are very many living in other parts of Europe. But we should also remember and if people hadn't migrated to this country, we would have a much worse health service, education system and transport system than we have. The contribution that's made to your living standards and mine by people who have come here is huge. But I'll tell you what will change. We will not allow companies to bring in whole groups of very low-paid workers in order to undercut often fairly low-paid workers in this country, <laughs> thus destroying their working conditions. And so... That is part of that managed process. At the moment, we have some disgraceful undercutting and we have huge impacts on different communities. The other point I just make in finality on this, because I can see Faisal's moving his hands, is that um, we would also reinstate something that Gordon Brown introduced when he was Prime Minister, which was an impact fund for communities that had had an influx of um, new, new residents and needed support on vital local services. And so we accept the result. We negotiate with Europe, we have a good relationship with Europe, and we manage our own future. To, just, just help Roxanne out here, um, you won't give a number, but the current net figure is 248,000. Higher, lower, well, the same? I, I would have for? thought, under a managed migration system, it certainly wouldn't go up anymore. It would probably, uh, probably, but I don't want to be held to this, come down. That's a probability. No, I but I would say we have to recognise that we do have serious skill shortage in this country because we have not invested enough in education and training for a very long time in this country. We need to turn that okay. right. Miranda. Where's Miranda? Miranda. Hi. Uh, hello. Hi, Miranda. How are you doing? <laughs> um, by contrast, I'm a Remain voter, um, and I feel that the Labour response to Brexit has been lacklustre. Um, I don't really see a big difference between the Tory and Labour responses, but it's a really big issue for me. Um, can you tell me why I should vote Labour instead of Lib Dem as part of the 48%? Because we have to accept the reality of the result of the referendum. It happened. It was a democratic choice. More people voted in that than any other recorded vote in our history. And so it's there. It's a decision. That doesn't mean we're, we're leaving the European Union. It doesn't mean we're leaving Europe as a continent. It's still there, obviously, and we're going to have to have a relationship with it. I've said, and I, in answer to our friend over there, I said that um, we would guarantee the rights of European Union nationals in Britain to remain here. And indeed, within days of the referendum, Andy Burnham, who was then our shadow Home Secretary, proposed that resolution in the House of Commons, and it was in fact carried uh, by a, a huge majority because the Conservatives chose not to take part. 
There's going to be a relationship with Europe. Our universities must have a close relationship with Europe. We will defend working rights, such as working time directive, paternal leave, maternity leave, all those very important things we've gained from the European Union. We'll protect those in the future. And we will also remain part of a number of very important agencies, such as policing and intelligence sharing, as well as environmental protocols. It's no good one side of a sea polluting it and the other side not. You've both got to agree not to pollute the sea. You have to work together to achieve things. So what I say to you is, the result is there. It happened. Let's build a sensible, good, tariff-free trade relationship with Europe. Every car that's made in Britain, or made most of the cars that are made in Germany, the parts come from both sides of the channel. You could say the same with aircraft. You could say the same with an awful lot of other manufacturing industry. That's going to carry on, and it will have to carry on. Otherwise, we'll destroy our own manufacturing industry. But I'll tell you what we won't do. We won't threaten Europe with turning this country into a sort of corporate tax haven with low tax, low wages, and low investment. We want high-wage, high-investment, growing economy with good relations with our neighbours and, indeed, of course, with the rest of the world. Well, on, well, on that, Mimit. Where's Mimit? Good evening, Jeremy. Evening. I'm a proud Mancunian and a small business owner brought up in a Labour voting household by salt-of-the-earth parents who have gave me their best. Why have you made it impossible for me to vote Labour in this election with your ruthless short-sighted policies such as 26% corporation tax, the abolishment of zero-hour contracts, £10 an hour minimum wage, and now you want to put VAT on my children's school fees. Yeah. Corporation tax was 28% in 2010. This government has reduced it and proposes to reduce it further. We're going to put it back up to 26%. And why are we doing that? Because this country is badly divided between the richest and the poorest. You put corporate tax and tax at the top end down, the division gets greater. Are you happy that so many of our children are going to school with supersized classes? So many of our children are going to school hungry? Are you happy with so many people waiting for hospital operations, a million waiting for social care? You don't address these problems by ignoring them. I appeal to you, as obviously a traditional person who supported our party, recognise that we're all better off when everybody is better off. And your children want to get a home of their own in the future. If we build the homes for them, both to rent as well as to buy, then they've got a better chance. Your children, I'm sure, would like to go to university. I do not believe we should charge fees for our students to go to universities because we all benefit from them graduating and becoming well-qualified citizens. So what we're proposing in this manifesto is transformational because for the first time for many years, we're saying this younger generation should not be worse off than we are, or ones that went before. They should actually be better off. This is about rejigging the way that we run our economy. But I'd also say, to anyone running a small business, I work with small businesses, I talk to them, I listen very carefully to what they have to say. They are often very badly exploited by much bigger business, who delay on payments, often don't pay at all, and force them out of business. We want a society and an economy that invests and a legal system that protects those that are working really hard. Surely, a £10 an hour minimum wage, a living wage, a real living wage, by 2020, would mean we actually spend probably a bit less on working tax credits, but it would also make an awful lot of people a lot better off. And do you know what? They'd spend the money in the local economy. It would be something that would be good for all of us. I appeal to you, think again. How did we get our welfare state in Britain? How do we get our national health service? We got it because the Labour Party was bold enough in the post-war period to invest in the future. Mr. Cool. Our Labour government will do the same. We're just trying to get one more... Yeah, David Gerrard. David. Thanks, David. Hi. This way. Okay. Given your long-standing support for nuclear disarmament, would you be prepared to use the nuclear deterrent, and if so, in what circumstances? I want to live in a world that's free of the danger of a nuclear holocaust. 
any nuclear weapon used anywhere in the world is a disaster for all of us. And I've spent my life working with peace organisations, working with the United Nations over the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty in order to bring about global disarmament. I would see my responsibility as our Prime Minister to contribute to a world of peace in the future. That means being very serious about the dangers, very serious about promoting what China is trying to achieve in Korea with the six-party talks, be very serious in what President Obama achieved with his agreement with Iran, but also look at the other threats that we face as well. Cyber attacks are very serious. We saw that with the attack on our National Health Service only a couple of weeks ago. Random acts of terror, such as we saw in Manchester, are a real threat as well. We have to defend our way of life, our society and our country by an intelligent engagement with the rest of the world. And I want to bring about uh, our contribution to a more peaceful world. Can I just keep the practical implication of David's question, which is in 11 days' time you could be Prime Minister and you would have to write those letters of last resort to the Trident submarine commanders. Are you going to write those letters? I will write the appropriate letter to our commanders, who are obviously very responsible, very loyal naval officers. OK, well, that brings us to the end of our first question and answer session of the evening. Thank you very much, Mr Corbyn. Thank you. And thank you very much. Coming next, Mr Corbyn, head-to-head -head with Jeremy Paxman. Jeremy Corbyn, in 11 days' time, you might be Prime Minister. People are entitled to know about you, aren't they? Yes. Are you frustrated... I'm looking, looking that... forward to it as well. Good. Are you frustrated that so many of your core ideas, your basic principles, didn't make it into this manifesto? Oh, come on, this is a really good manifesto. I'm glad you got it, by the way. It's a really well, good... I've, I've had to read it, too. <laughs> well, I helped to write it. Yeah, but it doesn't include key things that you believe Listen, in, does um... it? This manifesto is a product of sure. the views of the Labour Party, you have spent of your... party conference decisions and of the views put forward by individuals in the shadow cabinet. But this manifesto you fundamentally... You persuade the cabinet, can I, can the I, shadow can cabinet, can I to ex... A... No. Oh. oh, come on. Couldn't, couldn't come on, give us persuade a the shadow cabinet to accept your basic principle, which you have adhered to for the whole of your adult life, that there should be nuclear disarmament. You promise in this to renew Trident. There is a conference decision by the Labour Party, yeah. and as the leader of the party, I accept the democracy of our party. And is that answer, morally oh, right? In answer to the questions put earlier, I made the point that yeah. as Prime Minister, I will do all I can to bring about a nuclear-free world sure. because I'm horrified Here, at the very idea... The very horrified at the very idea of... A you nuclear promised attack to renew a nuclear weapon. It's there in the Is that in the morally program. right? Listen, it's there in our manifesto because our conference voted for it. I have to accept Do that Do you decision. think wait a minute, it's wait a morally minute. right? Can I finish? Can I finish? What I want to see... I'm asking you what I want to see. Do you think it's morally what right? What I want to see is a nuclear-free world. Of that course, everybody means, wants to see well, that. I'm but not, is it not so sure about right? it. If I'm not so sure you, about it. If I'm that's not what so sure you believe, about that. is it morally right to renew a nuclear deterrent? That is the decision that's been taken. We will work okay. for a well, nuclear free world. I know we you will don't work answer. through the Nuclear Non Proliferation Treaty to achieve that. That surely is something I, well worth doing. A number of your other core beliefs do make it into this manifesto, don't they? About nationalising the Royal Mail, for example, or the railways, or energy companies, or water companies. Why not banks? Well, some of our banks are publicly owned, as it is, actually. Hey, you uh, said you have always believed that banks should be publicly wait, wait, owned. Wait, 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 wait. There are some banks that are publicly owned. We will be promoting um, building societies, cooperatives, and we will be promoting a national investment bank, which won't be a lending bank, it will be an sure. investment bank. No, you believe and that in, is an important part of it. You believe in public ownership of retail banks. An important part 
of um, directing investment in this country. Of the retail banks, RBS is largely publicly owned. There is a public stake in most of the other banks, and that we will keep. I would always favour banks being in public ownership. You said that in yes, 2013. Yes, yes. You do. Well, I, I did say but that. But it doesn't get into the manifesto, well, does it? Jeremy, what we seem to be struggling Look. with here is an understanding of a process that brings about a manifesto. No, no. What I, we're struggling I, I am here not with a dictator. how much this represents what I you believe. I am not a dictator who writes things to tell people what to do. This is a product of a process in our party. That's why I was elected leader of our party, to give a voice to the members and those that are affiliated to our All party. All right, let's take another aspect of it. You say you'll freeze benefits for three years. You will? No, what we've said is we will put two billion into the benefit system no. per year in order... That's to, tax credits. ...in order to reduce the effects. We will also end the indignity of the... Will um, you freeze benefits for three years, of work test. Benefits will be paid, of course. Benefits will be uprated. Of course they'll be paid. And will be uprated, of course. And there they, will so be... they won't be frozen. And there will be a higher living wage, as I've outlined, which will, of course, mean that those benefits that are paid for people in work, and indeed the majority of benefits go to people in work, not out of work, will probably reduce. I'm asking you whether they'll be frozen. No, they're not going to be frozen because they'll be uprated every year, as they should be. Thank you. What about money for the security services? How can we take that seriously when your shadow chancellor was photographed holding a letter which called for the abolition of MI5, the abolition of a special branch and the disarming of the police? We've made it very clear... <laughs> we have made it very clear that we will provide more police. This government has taken 20,000 police officers off our streets. But you don't we'll, deny can I finish? that John we'll put, said all We'll that. put 10,000 more on our streets. We've also said quite clearly... How can that we believe that when the Shadow Chancellor believes in disbanding MI5 the Shadow the Chancellor, Special Branch? The Shadow Chancellor is the one who signed off that pledge in the manifesto. So he says one thing one day and one thing another day. John McDonnell supports the need for more police officers. John McDonnell also accepts... Does he still and believe in abolishing also, MI5? ...also accepts the need for the accountability to Parliament of our security services, which is important, but he also accepts, as I do, the need to have security services that do protect us. Manchester is a good example, and I think mm. when all the inquiries have been so, completed in Manchester, I think we need to look at those needs. So he signs letters which call for the abolition of MI5 and special branch and the rest of it, but when it comes to the manifesto, he's perfectly happy to sign off on more police officers and doubtless more money for MI5. What you're going to see with John McDonnell is a Chancellor that looks at the needs of the country, well, looks, at the needs, looks, letter, looks at the needs of the people of this country and invests in our future, not hands money away in tax relief to big corporations and at the top end of our society. There is nothing in this manifesto about getting rid of the monarchy, which is another thing you believe in, isn't it? Look, there's nothing in there because we're not going to do it. <laughs> but you do believe in it, don't you? Listen, it's not on anybody's agenda. It's certainly not on my agenda. And do you know what? I had a very nice chat with the Queen. But you don't like her, do you? You don't like what she represents. We got along absolutely fine, perfectly charming. I don't think she should any, be brought into political discussion. Any human being anywhere can have a nice conversation with anybody, but you not, do not believe in the institution of monarchy, do you? Look, I believe in a democracy, and we live in a democracy. We have a titular head of state as, um, as the monarch, but and without when political the power. the Queen's reign comes to an end, should there be called a, call stumps on the whole thing, then? Call it a day. Look, the law is there, and that's what will, will prevail. What I, I'm, I'm fighting this election, Jeremy, on something very important. Yeah, that, is the, that is the levels of poverty in our society. The, the levels of children you... that are not supported properly in our society. The I'm fighting this election. reflects your beliefs. Jeremy, I'm fighting this election on social justice. I'm fighting yeah. this election to give us a stronger a whole, economy for the future. There's a whole and, series uh, of things that you couldn't even persuade your own party to put in the manifesto that you believe in. Jeremy, this manifesto reflects what would be a profound 
and very good change in our society. Because for the first time, you'd have a government that was saying, you cannot go on loading our students with debt. You cannot go on overcrowding our classrooms. You cannot go on underfunding our hospitals. You have to invest by all of us for the future of all of us. Sure. I don't want to live in a country of food banks I don't want to live in a country of homeless people. I want to live in a country that actually does seriously Look, care for all. When you're Prime Minister, when you're Prime Minister, you will have to take this country into negotiations yes. with the rest of Europe. Yes. When they look at you and they see a man who cannot get his core beliefs into his own manifesto, are they going to take you seriously? Listen, what they're going to take very seriously is that we would have been elected with a mandate, a mandate to negotiate a tariff-free trade access to the European market, that we will protect European nationals living here. What they will see is a government that is going to protect the protocols, environmental conditions, workers' rights that we achieved through Europe, and a government that wants a serious relationship with Europe, but respects the result of our referendum in that we're leaving the European you Union. You are prepared to contemplate then no deal? There's going to be a deal. There is going to be a yes. deal. Would you leave Europe without a deal? We will make sure there's a deal. And you know what? We won't How start... much of our money are you prepared to we give Brussels? We won't start the negotiations by megaphone diplomacy and threatening Europe with uh, some kind of offshore tax haven on the shores of Europe. How we'll start those negotiations are you to give seriously, to seriously, with respect to them. How much money are you prepared to give to Brussels in order to get a deal? Jeremy, there are going to be negotiations over all of that. I've seen the figures that Michel Barnier has bandied around. I don't recognise those figures. Others may not also. We will obviously negotiate them. Where we have a legal obligation, it must be met. Where the EU has a legal obligation, it must be met. But so you have, we have to recognise... So you've done some sums. We have to recognise... You've done some leave, sums, haven't have you? To you know how many billions We have to recognise we're leaving the European Union. The priority has to be tariff-free trade access, because we have a lot of manufacturing industry... Haven't that you relies... done any sums? C can I finish, please? No. Really? Just for no. a second? No, I'm asking no, you for I'm a trying to explain... How much are you prepared to give to get a deal? Jeremy, I'm trying to explain the basis on which we propose to negotiate. And I'm okay. asking you a very simple question. How much are you prepared and you know what? to pay to get a deal? There is no answer to your question, because nobody, yes, could, there is. nobody could answer it at this stage. Well, I've you said... don't know. I've said... What we would do is pay that we are legally required to do. There will have to be an agreement on trade access. Now, it's not a one-way street because all of our manufacturing industry relies on supply chains across Europe, as indeed many European sure. manufacturers supply, on, uh, require, uh, supply chains from this side of the channel as well. Would a Corbyn Brexit mean lower immigration to this country from outside the EU? We had that discussion with the audience um, earlier on. Free movement... You said probably. Free movement ends uh, when we leave the European Union. We will, as I've so said... you're not giving any guarantee on immigration? I've said we'll protect the rights of EU nationals here and we want the same for British nationals across Europe because these are people, they're families... I'm asking you about immigration. Yeah, and we will stop the undercutting that goes on by importation of low-paid workers. There will be migration of managed, yeah. necessary to sustain our economy. I'm not going to sit here and make promises. Theresa May has done that for the third election running and hasn't got anywhere near meeting her promises in the last two. So you're not making any promise about whether you would reduce immigration? I suspect it would probably be slightly less or less, probably. but... but probably listen, is hardly a listen, commitment, is it? Nobody, Do you think there are too many immigrants in this country? Listen, we require migrant workers to maintain yeah. our health service and much of our industry. We have a skills gap because we haven't invested enough in skills training. Let's look at the security of the state then. The primary duty of a Prime Minister, the overwhelming duty, is the protection of the state. And yet the only time in recent history that there has been an invasion of British soil was the invasion of the Falklands. And you recall what you said then, well, don't you? I wanted there to be a, a, a UN-brokered plan of a ceasefire at that time, which President Terry of Peru was trying to pursue. You said that young, unemployed men were being sent to the South Atlantic to die 
mm. in pursuit of a Tory plot. What I wanted was a stopping of that war. I didn't want any young men, British or Argentinian, or anybody else to die in that war. And as Did you the not UN, think the Argentines the, should have got out of the Falklands? I don't think they should have gone in there. But I also think there should have been an opportunity to prevent that war happening by the UN, which was being attempted at that time. So you do think time. it was a Tory was plot, do you? No, I think it was important. Why did that you say I think, so, I think it was important that there should be a negotiated solution to that through the United Nations. That surely... If you didn't believe look, it was a Tory plot, Jeremy, why surely, did you say you thought it was? Jeremy, Margaret Thatcher made a great deal of, uh, of the whole issue, as everybody could see at the time. I felt that she was exploiting the situation, but... There has to be, at the end of every conflict, there has to be a peace process. So Why don't we start with the objective of trying to get a peace process? Looking back and on use, it, you realise you Use our wrong, councils then. through the United Nations to achieve Because that. it's quite possible that in a couple of weeks' time, if you're sitting in Downing Street, the Chief of the Defence Staff could come to you and say, we have eyes on a man in Iraq or in Syria or in Afghanistan who is plotting a bombing campaign in Britain. You have 20 minutes to make up your mind as to whether we take him out with a drone strike. Uh, now, if you think... Do you think that's a Tory plot as well? I would want to know the circumstances, the evidence and yeah. what would happen... It's happened before. And also what the effect of it would be on innocent civilians around. Because you would be prepared to take such a decision. Listen, would you? I've, we you had it, would we, be this, prepared to take such a decision. Taking somebody, uh, killing somebody actually happened outside Parliament what, a month ago, didn't Yes. It? And uh, I think you have to look at all the evidence that's there. But you can't answer a hypothetical question without the evidence around But it. it's not really hypothetical. It's a completely it hypothetical David question. Cameron and Jihadi John. It's a completely hypothetical question. We have to look at the evidence that's there you at the time. You would be prepared We have to, to look at the that evidence that's there at the time the to, to make neutral. that fatal decision one way or the other. Why did, then did you describe the killing of Osama bin Laden as a tragedy? Because I think he should have been arrested and I think he should have been put on trial. And he could have been. You think that was a tragedy? I think the whole... Um, I think the whole... Uh, Afghan experience is a tragedy, and I think the, he should have been put on trial. See, what bothers a lot of people is the friends that you have made in your campaign, doubtless heart heartfully felt for peace. Like Hamas, for example. You know that Hamas have killed civilians, and yet you call them your friends. It was inclusive language at a meeting in which I was promoting the idea of a two-state solution in which I was promoting the need for dialogue between Israel and all aspects of Palestine, including Hamas, as well as including Fatah. I think to bring about a peace process, that is important. Do you know what happened last night in Tel Aviv? There was a very large demonstration of people wanting a peace process and a dialogue. I think those are people you've got to work with. You've got to work with people you often you don't with agree with you're and don't like. Happy to and call Hamas your friends listen, despite the was, fact they kill it was an inclusive piece women of, and children. It was an inclusive piece of language in order to get a meeting underway. I do not agree with them. I do not support them. I want there to be a process. No, but at the friends. end of the day, there has to be a process in which people talk to each other. You know that. Jeremy Corbyn, thank you. Coming next, the Prime Minister Theresa May is here and ready to meet our audience. This is May versus Corbyn, the battle for number 10. It's time for our audience and you at home to meet the Prime Minister, Theresa May. Hello, Hello Tyson. Happy birthday, by the way. <laughs> OK, well, let's get started uh, with our first question from Martin. Martin. Good evening, Prime Minister. 
Good evening, As a Martin. serving police officer, I have been witness to the devastating effects of police courts during your time as Home Secretary. And now, after the horrendous terrorist attacks in Manchester last Monday, we have seen the need to draft in the military. What promise can you make to increase the number of police officers and can I ask you to provide us with a specific number of how many extra police officers that will be recruited under your government and how you propose to fund it? Well, Martin, as a serving police officer, obviously you'll be aware that we have uh, police and counter-terrorism police. We've been very clear that we have protected the budgets for counter-terrorism policing and we're currently protecting overall police budgets as well. And we're ensuring that we're putting money in to enable the police to address what are actually different ways, as you will know, different types of crime. Crime is changing and policing will be changing in the future. It's why we're putting more money, for example, into cyber policing, because increasingly we see those as the sort of crimes that are having to be addressed. We did uh, put, uh, do what was called Operation Tempera, which enabled the military to assist the police following the terrible, horrific attack that took place in Manchester. That's been a well-prepared plan for some time, and that was put into operation and put into operation smoothly and is now being run down. What is important is that we not only ensure we have the counter-terrorism police we need and the overall police that we need, but also that they have the powers that they need. And that's what I've done as Home Secretary. I ensured that we brought through new legislation to put powers into place which gave the police what they were asking for in, able to, in order to be able to deal with counter-terrorism. Promising to clarify for, for Martin, when you became Home Secretary, the, the staff numbers of police were 141,850. That's September 2010. What are they now? 124,000. So that's down 20,000. That's what he's talking about. And armed... Armed officers were nearly 7,000 in March 2010 and now... We've, uh, well, we've, we're currently having an uplift in the number of armed officers. We agreed that not just the normal armed officers should be increased, but actually the counter-terrorism specialist officers were, as well. But they were cut over six years and you've had to put them back in. Was that a mistake? Is that... What, we, what we have asked, what we had to do when we came into government in 2010 was to ensure that we were uh, living within our means. And that was very important because of the economic situation we'd inherited. Now, what we need to do in policing terms is ensure it's not just about the numbers of police. People often focus on the numbers of police. It's actually about what the police are able to do and how they are being deployed on our streets. As I say, in counter-terrorism policing, we have protected those budgets and we're currently protecting police budgets. But crime is changing. And the sort of job that the police officers need to do is changing. That's why we're also putting extra money into things like cybercrime, because that's today's world. So a government has to ensure that we're keeping abreast with the changes that take place, with the challenges that there are out there that we need to deal with. And of course the terrorist threat is severe. Uh, that's where it is at the moment. But that's why we ensure that our police, our security service, uh, have that counter-terrorism budgets, we are increasing the budgets for our security services as well, but also that they have the powers they need to do the job. Just a quick, quick comeback, Martin. I appreciate you're protecting the budgets, but we still need the staff to carry out the role of a police officer of keeping the public safe. OK, well, let's, let's move on to Philip. Uh, Philip, Philip. Prime Minister, in my first job 74 years ago, I earned the princely sum of 31 shillings a week, which is £1.55 in current money. I lived in a council house with my four siblings and my parents in the George Orwell's Wigan of the 1930s. Over the years, due to our hard work and the work of my late wife, we came to own our own home and it is now mortgage-free. I don't like the prospect of being unable to leave it to our family with a greatly eroded value, which I fear is what would happen if you were to introduce your so-called dementia tax. So why, Prime Minister, should we, in my generation, vote for you? Well, <laughs> Philip, thank you, because you've raised an issue which I know a lot of people are looking at and thinking about. And it's a really important issue because one of the great challenges that we face as a society and that government faces is the fact that our society is ageing. We see more people. It's great that people are living longer, but of course that has an impact in terms of the services 
we have to provide and ensuring people can have the dignity in their old age. Now, the situation, as I'm sure you know at the moment, is that if you require care and you have savings of more than £23,000, you have to pay for that care. And if the care you require is residential care, then your house, the value of your house is taken into account. So what happens is people are paying for care. People are finding that they are having to sell their house. Many people are having to sell their house to pay those care bills. And many find that they're not able to leave uh, the money to their, to their families. Now, I want to take those risks away. And that's what the proposals I've put forward are about. It's about ensuring that nobody is going to have to sell their house to pay for care in their lifetime. It's about ensuring that £100,000 of savings of assets are protected to pass on to the family. Uh, we'll put a cap on the absolute, an absolute cap on the level of money that people have to spend on care. And I think what we're doing is ensuring that we can have a sustainable solution for the long term. If I can just give one figure, Faisal, in 10 years' time, there will be 2 million more people aged over 75. If we don't address the issue of our social care system now, then it is going to collapse. We need to do it, and do it in a way that's fairer to younger generations. And that's what my plans are for. Prime Minister, can you, just, can you just clarify for Philip and people at home, what is the cap? Is it a manifesto policy that there'll be a cap? There will be a cap, yes. What we set out in the manifesto is the principles of our position. I then saw a lot of scaremongering about that. I heard a lot of scaremongering about it and recognised that people would be worried as a result of that. 100,000? So we, clari we clarified that there will be a cap. But what we will do, Faisal, is not just put a figure on it. What we will do is publish a, a green paper, a consultation document. We'll listen to people. We'll listen to voters. We'll listen to charities and organisations working with older people. We'll take people's views on where that cap should be. And I think that's a fairer way to do it. OK. Amanda. Good evening. Are we dividing England and Scotland by allowing a winter fuel allowance for over 60s in Scotland? Is this fair? Well, we have a situation, as you know, where there's a devolved government in Scotland and they have the ability to make separate decisions on a whole variety of issues affecting people in Scotland. And uh, they've, re they've been given extra powers in relation to dealing with welfare. So it is up to them to make that decision as to how they choose to apply uh, the wealth certain welfare benefits. We will, we have said, and we will in government means test the winter fuel payment and, and the reason for doing that is is this at the moment we have a situation where pensioners who are better off are getting that help and support where you see working families who might be struggling not getting uh, that sort of support and I think it's right and I think you know I've met pensioners who've said to me that they don't think they should get that winter fuel payment what we will do with the money that's released is we'll put it into health and social care so it'll be going towards actually ensuring that those systems are providing better quality care for, for older people and others. So, Prime Minister, we know that Scottish pensioners will keep the winter fuel allowance. Can you tell us how many English pensioners will lose it? The IFS have assumed £6 million, the Resolution Foundation £10 million. It's clearly several million, isn't it? Well, what we're going to do, Faisal, I'm sorry, it, it's exactly the same as I've just said on the social care cap is once again, I think this is an issue where we need not just to pull out a figure in an election campaign, but actually to listen to people, to talk to people, to take people's views, and then make a proposal as, uh, as government. So there's a proper consultation. So we're actually hearing from voters, we're hearing from organisations and charities and others who work with older people about what they think is the right level to set that, uh, that, that uh, threshold for winter fuel payments at. But the key thing, the key principle that would drive what we do is that less well-off pensioners will be protected. OK, all right, let's uh, move on to Nicola. Good evening. As a teacher and mother of two, I am incredibly concerned by your proposed changes to school funding, with my local constituency of Batley and Spen, one of the worst affected areas. Prime Minister, despite your manifesto promises, these cuts are clearly unsustainable. Are you prepared to change our current plans to prevent further damage to our schools? Well, <laughs> Nicola, what we will do in government is put further record levels of funding into schools. 
Uh, but we also do want to look at ensuring that the money is being distributed in a fair way. And as you probably know, there are some schools in the country today that may receive twice the amount of funding for uh, a, a pupil that other schools receive. I think it's important that we see a fair uh, way of funding our schools. Uh, what we're committed to is ensuring that as we introduce that, schools won't see any cash reduction in their level of funding. But I actually want to do more than that because I believe that education is absolutely crucial. We want our youngsters to get the best possible start in life. And that's why I want to see a more diverse system of, uh, of schools available for people. I want to bring in some of the uh, expertise that we see in universities, for example, in supporting schools. There are some good examples of that at the moment. Let's do more of that. Let's make sure that every child has a good school place and a school place that is right for them, because that's about ensuring they get the best possible start of, in life to be the best that they can because I want our society to be one where it's down to your talents and hard work how far you go and not where you came from or who your parents are. I think Nicholas' question was about per pupil funding in real terms. You've said it's going to go up four billion but, but that is going down. In real terms per pupil it is going down. Can you clarify that? Nobody can guarantee the real terms uh, per pupil funding increase. I mean the Labour Party's manifesto we know the figures don't add up. What is important is that as we look... What, what, You've clearly failed. Just please let the Prime Minister answer. Sorry. Please. Sorry. What, we, what we need to do is to ensure we will put those record levels of funding into schools. We need to ensure that we get that better spread of funding in terms of the fair funding formula. But I also say this, if you look at what happens in education, it's not just people are focusing on funding. But actually we need to ensure that we do see good or outstanding schools and more good or outstanding uh, places in good or outstanding schools for children. We've seen the number increase over the last seven years. We need to carry on doing that so that there is a good school place for every child. And that isn't just about funding. It's about a whole variety of things that go to make up really good education for children. OK, uh, next question, Joy. Oops. Hello, I'm over here. Um, Theresa May, could you please justify to me why I have leaflets saved at home, delivered to me by my local Conservatives before the EU referendum, stating clearly that we will save £350 million per week for the NHS if we leave the EU? That lie is the only reason why I, and I'm sure many others here tonight possibly, um, decided to vote leave. There were a number of claims made during the referendum campaign on both sides of the argument and there were some passionately held views and some really um, you know, passionate arguments on both sides. I think what's important now is that we ensure that we get the best possible deal from Brexit. That is about negotiating a really good deal for Britain. It is about ensuring that in future we won't be sending vast sums of money to the European Union every year as we do as members of the EU. And we will be able to look at what, uh, as funding comes back, how we use that funding. But it is important that we get that best possible deal because it underpins so much else of what we want to do. And we can only get that deal if we've got a plan to go in there and really stand up for Britain. And the no negotiations will start 11 days after Election Day. So we have to know what we're doing. We have to have a strong hand in the negotiations and be very clear about getting the best possible deal for Britain. That, that, that wasn't quite an... Are you happy with the answer, Joy? Well, there we go. Persuaded Joy. Well, let's move on to Angela. Prime Minister, um, I'm a midwife in Devon, and I believe the wealth of a nation lies in the health of its workforce. How do you justify the chronic underfunding of the NHS that I see at work, considering that we now have one of the lowest budgets according to GDP? Well, once again, if we look at the health service, and obviously you work in the health service, so you know the enormity of the task that the health service faces. We're making greater demands on the health service every year. Uh, the overall figure is we're spending over the five years up to 2020, we'll be spending half a trillion pounds in total on the National Health Service. Uh, but what's imp And we do need to make sure that money is being spent well, of course. So we are increasing the funding into the health service and will increase funding into the health service in the future. 
and we're committed to that in our manifesto, both in terms of buildings and technology, but also in terms of increasing the per head funding for uh, the National Health Service in real terms every year. It's important. We, we all rely on the health service. We all know people either who work in the health service like yourself, who've been through the health service, who've had great care and attention from the fantastic staff in the health service. That's why we're ensuring that we are putting more money into the NHS and more money for the future as well as what is happening at the moment. We want that first class NHS, but we can only do that if we have a really strong economy to pay for it. And that's where the Brexit negotiations, but so much else actually comes in, because it's making sure we get that right deal for Britain from Brexit, that we can build on the strong economy and the economic progress we've made in the last few years. Because if we do that, then we have that money to fund that first class national health service. That's what we're committed to. OK, uh, what did you think of that answer? Throw it back to you. Um, I see a lot of efficiency savings that are actually cuts. I see hospitals closing. Um, I see staff that are at their wits end because they can't give the care that they want to give. I'll believe it when I see it. OK, um, let's go to Sandeep. Sandeep. Where's Sandeep? Sandeep. Oh, sorry. There we go. Thank Hello, you. Prime Minister. Hello. Um, Prime Minister, describing yourself and being described as a bloody difficult woman may be helpful in Brexit negotiations with the EU, but do you think the same attitude when applied to domestic policy, such as welfare reform and cuts, have reinforced the image of the Conservatives are being called the nasty party again? When uh, I was described as, uh, in the terms that you've uh, said as a, as a difficult woman, uh, I think it was about, uh, because my colleague who used that term saw me as somebody who actually stood, what I, stood by what I thought was right and was willing to fight what I believe for what I believe is the right thing to do. And that's what drives me. It's doing what is the right thing by the country. And sometimes you have to be difficult in order to do that. Uh, but... If I look at what's coming ahead to this country, we stand at a very important moment in our history. We have the opportunity now for, to really change this country for the better, for the future. And that is about tough negotiations for Brexit, but it's also about facing up to those domestic challenges, domestic challenges like the ageing society, like the changing face we see in the workplace, the increased technology in the workplace, all of these are things that we need to have a government that recognises it, is open about those issues and is willing to find ways of addressing them. And if in order to address them and do the right thing by the country, it takes being a difficult woman, then that's exactly what I will be. So, so Prime, Prime Minister, the question was about nasty party applied to domestic policy and you're asking fairly uniquely for a massive majority. You're already Prime Minister, you want a really big majority. That will also apply to domestic policy. And you voted for things that we subsequently you turned on, like tax credit cuts in 2015. Uh, isn't that what will not be able to be turned around when you have a larger majority, if that's what you get? Well, you say, what I'm doing, Faisal, is actually going out across the country asking people, yes, to put their... Uh, to, to, that, for, me to gain their trust so that they can, uh, will support me at this election. Because I think it is important to have a strong hand in the negotiations for Brexit, to have that strong mandate for those negotiations. Um, but we also have a lot of challenges to face here in this country. And as I've said, there are, uh, Brexit is one of the challenges, getting that right. Our ageing society is another. The divisions within our society is another. And the, uh, the issue of a strong, making sure we have a strong economy and facing the impact of changing technology and the impact that's having on our lives and our workplace, as everybody will know. These are big challenges ahead and the domestic policies that I've set out are policies to address those challenges and some of them will, will involve difficult choices. But I think it's right if I'm saying to people I want a mandate to be Prime Minister and uh, to have the government of this country that we're actually open with people that there will be some hard choices. OK, well, that brings us to the end of our second question and answer session.
of the evening. Thank you very much, Prime Minister. Thank you. Thanks again to the audience for their questions. Coming next, Theresa May sits down with Jeremy Paxman. Theresa May, when did you realise that you'd got the wrong answer to the biggest question of our times in politics? Well, I'm tempted to ask you, Jeremy, what you think. Do you mean you're talking about Brexit? <gasps> well, of course. Right. Well, there are, lots of, there are lots of challenges in our politics at the moment. There are lots of challenges that the government face. I'm just I, curious, I campaigned... what, was, what was it convinced you that Brexit was so bad for Britain? I gave, a, I set out my reasons for deciding that we should, uh, on balance, stay within the European Union. I voted to remain. I campaigned to remain. And when did you but change I, your mind? The British people were given the choice, and the British people so, decided that they wanted the United Kingdom to leave the European Union. So you are now stuck with trying to deliver something you believe is bad no, for this country. I'm, I'm delivering what I believe the British people want their government to deliver. And I think it's very important. I think it's, an Im it's not just an issue about Brexit itself. It's actually an issue to me about trust in politicians. Hang on that a if second. We, if you said in March last year that we will be more secure, more prosperous and more influential, virtually in those words, if we stayed in the European Union. And now you want to take us out of it. And I also said that the sky wouldn't fall in if we left the European Union. So you have we changed gave, your mind, have we you? Gave, we gave people the choice. You've changed your mind. We, I'll answer that in a minute. We gave people the choice, Jeremy, yeah. and the British people decided to leave the European Union. Yeah. And, and I think it's important for them to see their politicians delivering on that choice and respecting the will of the people. And what I think... Sure, OK. So you've changed your mind. What I am now doing is... Have different. you changed your mind? I think there are huge opportunities Have you changed your mind? Jeremy, I know that you uh, have used, used this tactic and you want I'm just trying to, to get an answer. Yes, That's all yes. you can say, yes or no. I haven't changed my mind. Yes, you, I have changed my mind. Same I, you like. I, have, I take the view that we can make a success of Brexit. I take the view that the British people want but us to make that success. you don't believe in it. Of course, Jeremy, I'm, as Prime Minister, I've been out there already ensuring that the negotiations are going to start and... I want to ensure that there's a strong hand in those negotiations. Well, I believe in making a success of Brexit for the whole of the United Kingdom. But you Kingdom. don't really believe in it, do you? I believe in making a success of Brexit. Let me look at it another way. How was it that people like Boris Johnson, Michael Gove, David Davis, Priti Patel, even Andrea Leadsom, they all got it right and you got it wrong? I... Voted well. There's no gain saying the fact that I campaigned to remain and voted to remain. Sure, but I you also still think said, it's a duff idea. I said, I said it was a balanced. <laughs> sorry. You still think it's a duff idea, no, don't you? No, I think that you haven't I, changed no, your mind. Look, the referendum drew a line under those debates. What the referendum did was took the view of the British people. Now, I think it's right that we do that now, and I think I genuinely think that if we get Brexit right, and this is really important for us. If we get Brexit right, we can make a real success of the opportunities that open up for us. But we can only do that if we grasp those opportunities. But you still think it's a and bad idea. That. No, I believe we're doing the right thing in making a success of Brexit. Well, of course you want to make a success of it. Can we look at something else that you've changed your mind on, or perhaps not changed your mind on? Social care. Now, you had a manifesto commitment which said there would be a cap on the cost of social care. Then your latest manifesto dropped that. And for clarification, the health secretary said there will be no cap. And four days later, you said there will be a cap. We had uh, what uh, Jeremy Hunt was talking about and what we referred to in our manifesto was the specific proposal. This, this proposal was put forward by Andrew Dillnot a few years ago when he was asked by government to look at the social care issue. And if I just explain why we rejected that deal-not proposal, Jeremy, 
it was because, for two reasons. First of all, um, because it was going to be paid for out of general taxation. Yes. And secondly, because that deal not proposal protected wealthier pensioners, but did nothing to protect pensioners on modest incomes. Now, right. the proposals I've put forward actually do that. They do help pensioners on modest incomes. And crucially, they ensure we have a long-term sustainable solution for right. social care. OK, you have said earlier that it's very important that people can trust their politicians <laughs> and their governments. Can I ask you explicitly, unambiguously, what will the cap be? I've, uh, well, as I've just answered, I'm not going to give you a different answer you from the one know. I've given Fa Faisal. No, it's not about not knowing, Jeremy. It's about thinking what... It's about you thinking, don't know, do you? It's about thinking what the right approach is to get to that figure. But you and don't what know. And we, what we want to do is to ask, is to consult, is to listen, and then to determine what that cut will be. Have and you I think, even thought I think what the cost fair. of the taxpayer will be? I think that's only fair to people that we actually go through that consultation and say to people and take people's views right. as just we determine a, that cap. Just at a philosophical level, you said you went into politics to help the just about managing. How is enabling rich people to pass on wealth to the next generation helping the just about managing? Well, What is helping is ensuring that we don't have a long-term solution that wasn't my for our question. social... No, no. No, my question was how it helped the Just About Managing. And I'm answering your question, You're not. Jeremy. You have asked me about the Just About Managing and how they're being helped. And what I'm going to point out is that if you have a social care system mm. which relies on taxing those Just About Managing higher, at higher levels, mm -hmm. that's not helping them. What we're doing is putting forward a proposal which means that people don't have to sell their house in their lifetime to pay for care. It means they can pass on savings to their children. And it means Please. there will be that cap. But it's fair across the generations. Can we... And there are older people today who worry that their children and grandchildren won't have a better future. Can we look at something else on which you've changed your mind? Only this March in the budget... You propose to increase national insurance contributions from the self-employed. Within a week, you back down from that. You accept yes. that? Yes, I accept that. And we yeah. very clearly stated at the you time... You see, what, we, what one's bound to say is, if I was sitting in Brussels and I was looking at you as the person I had to negotiate with, I'd think, she's a blowhard who collapses at the first sign of gunfire. <laughs> I think, uh, I think, Jeremy, you'll find that what the people in Brussels look at is the record that I had of negotiating with them in Brussels and delivering for this country on a number of issues on justice and home affairs, which Can people you... said we were never going to get. All right. And I got those negotiations. Can you remind us how many times you told us after you became Prime Minister that there would not be a general election until 2020? <laughs> You did, didn't you? I mean, I, I got to a grand total of six times on which you or your spokesman said yes. there wouldn't be one. And I said there wouldn't be a general election. And after I became Prime Minister, I felt that the most important thing for the country was the stability and getting on with triggering sure. the Article 50 so that we made sure that we were delivering on that vote on Brexit. What became clear when we were going through that process is that other parties want to frustrate that process of those Brexit mm. negotiations. We have, we have the Liberal Democrats wanting a second referendum. That's all happened since have, March, has it? We have the... Well, actually, it was March. It was in March that I triggered Article 50 by writing the letter to the European Council. It was uh, in to March you Council. told us we didn't have a, need to have a general election because it would destabilise the country until 2020. And what became clear as we were looking through those negotiations, as they started those negotiations, to be, started the process of triggering them, what became clear, increasingly clear, as is clear in this election campaign, is the desire of other parties to frustrate the will of the British people. That's why I thought it was right to go out for an election.
Minister, are, are you somebody who takes responsibility for their mistakes? I take responsibility for the decisions I make, Jeremy. Right. So you have been how many years in government now? In government? Yes. I've been uh, in government since 2010, so seven yes. years in Seven government. years in government, and you'll recall the manifesto promises on immigration. Indeed I do. You bring it, you, you've repeated them, in fact, in yes. this manifesto. Yes. Said the same thing again because you've failed. In your capacity, six of those seven years, you were Home Secretary, weren't you? I was indeed. Yeah. Immigration was your main task to get it down to what you promised in the manifesto, which was 100,000 or less non-EU immigrants per year net. You didn't do net, that, did you? Net migration? No, we didn't achieve that. We did... Uh, you, what can happened? Can you just tell us what it is now? Yes, it was 248,000 in the last set of figures. What we non saw was EU the figures migrants? coming... non Sorry? Non-EU migrants? was about 170, 175,000. Yeah. It's 175,000 according the, to the latest figures, yes. yes. The, what we saw so, in immigration figures was it started to come down, then they did go up, and now they're starting to come down again. What we will have that, when we leave the EU... That was your job. Is the, yes. <laughs> Jeremy, I'm not sitting here saying it wasn't. I'm accepting that what, what we had to do was to ensure that we were uh, rooting out abuse in the system... But there is no single moment where you take one measure which changes the immigration figures. It is a constant work to ensure that you're dealing with immigration and mm. ensuring there is no more abuse in the system. There's more work to be done. We will, of course, have another uh, tool to, to, to do this of when we leave the European Union because we'll be able to introduce rules for people coming from within the sure. European Union. But this will be a constant work. Uh, how, who won't be able to come to this country under your new rules? Well, we're working at the moment on what those new rules should be uh, in terms of... So you still don't have any idea? But No, it's not about that. <laughs> we have a set of rules for people from outside the European Union. We will look at the requirements for... Uh, one of the things we do is ensure that it's possible for people to be brought in where there are skill shortages, where there is a need for people to come to, uh, to and, work. And, and what's the but damage going to be to the economy? Have you worked that out? The, I think one of the crucial things we need to do in this country is ensure that actually we are enabling people here in the UK to be skilled up to do jobs. I think sometimes, sometimes well, what we've seen is people bring, being brought in from overseas because we haven't done sufficient see, I mean, in, the in this country. That's why... Your I think friend George Osborne, or your so friend important. until you sacked him, the <laughs> Chancellor of the Exchequer, George Osborne, says this policy is economically illiterate. It's a policy which will actually... Well, he should know, shouldn't he? It's a policy which ensures that we are recognising the concerns that people in this country have about uncontrolled immigration. Controlling immigration is important. Right. It's important for... A number of reasons, but one of the reasons it's important is because uncontrolled migration has an impact on wages at the lower end of the income Absolutely. scale. Yeah. People feel an impact from that. That's why I think it's so important that we keep working at this and we keep. And you that say it's much easier. It'll down. be much easier once we've left the European Union, won't it? We will be able to introduce rules for people coming mm. from within the European yeah. Union once we've left. That will. That's been a piece of the. Uh, work on immigration. How much of our money are you to prepared to give Brussels in order to get a deal? I don't think it's going to be about paying over money to get a deal. What I think is important you, is that... You're not prepared to pay anything. I mean, David Davis have, said he'd walk away at 100,000. 100 we, million. 100 billion, sorry. We have uh, we've made clear, I've put it in the uh, manifesto, that we will well, look for a fair... Would you pay billion to leave the European Union? That we will put a fair settlement, look for a fair settlement of our rights and obligations. There are a number of figures that are being, uh, that are being quoted and being around, a, a number of them coming from the European Union. Have you got any figure in your head? Union, a number coming from the European Union itself. We will look at our rights and obligations. Have you got a figure I'm... in your head as to how much it's worth paying to get out of this club? It isn't a question of what it's worth paying to get out. It's a question of what is going to be the right deal for us to leave the Europe, leaving the European Union, which will stop us from paying huge sums of money into the EU every single year, which will enable that we have control of our money and our borders and our laws.
But you wouldn't walk out as David Davis says he would at if, if there was a request for 100 billion. You wouldn't we, walk out there. We, we will be there to negotiate the right deal. But what I have said is no deal is better than a bad deal. We have to be prepared so, to walk out. So you are prepared to walk away from the European Union with no deal? No deal is better than a bad deal. And let me just tell that you... That wasn't about, exactly my question. Yes, my question prepared, was, are you well, prepared to walk away... By definition, if we're prepared to say, if I'm prepared to say that no deal is better than a bad deal, I want to get a good you, deal from the European Union. Uh, what I want don't to. want is the sort of bad deal that some people are talking about. If you think of about course. it, some people in Europe are talking about punishing us, mm. and that would be a bad deal for us. Some people here in the UK talk as if they're willing to do anything to sign up to a deal with the European Union, and that would be a bad deal for us as well. So we you need to negotiate are and negotiate to hard. to leave the European Union with no deal? As I say, no deal would be better than a bad deal. You are prepared to leave the yes, European no Union deal. with no deal? I, I think you can take it, Jeremy. No deal would be better than a bad deal. Yes, you said that repeatedly. Yes. What I'm... I'm, I'm not prepared to sign up to a bad deal for the UK. Now, I believe... So you are I'm prepared to walk away? I'm, 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 I think we have, you have to. In negotiations, you have mm. to recognise that you're prepared, that you're not in there to get a deal at any price. We're in there to get the best deal for the United Kingdom. And actually, I'm optimistic so about that because I think that there's... Uh, in the European Union, they will want to continue their relationship with us sure. as well. You can be as optimistic as you like, but you might have to walk away from it. What I will be doing is, as so we heard in the earlier session, what I'll be doing is being a difficult but, woman and ensuring that we're negotiating hard. But... <laughs> Theresa May, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. watching May versus Corbyn, the battle for number 10. The Prime Minister told our live studio audience a Conservative government would deliver a long-term sustainable solution for social care and that she's prepared to leave the EU with no deal rather than a bad one. And that Mr Corbyn said that immigration would probably fall under a Labour government and that leadership is not about being high and mighty but about getting to know people. If you want to watch again, you can watch the whole programme on 4-7 at 5 past 1 tonight. It'll also be available on demand at all four. You'll also be able to see the full programme at Sky News Catch Up, on the Sky News app on Sky Q and on Sky Go. And of course, coverage of the battle for number 10 continues on Sky News TV and mobile. There are nine days of campaigning left before polling day. We hope our programme has helped you decide a little. Thank you for watching and thanks too to our audience. Good night. Good night. <laughs>